So once again, everybody is just doing such a good job of being on time, which is awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, if you overheard our little stage talk there, you'll know that our next speaker is uh, Wolf Stuhler from uh, Germany, uh, which is very exciting. And um, I was also told to remind you that there is this voting thing going on. Remember, you got those cards, and you were so told that you could vote for somebody or something. Actually, I think you can vote for two people. If you're like me and you forgot slash lost your thing, apparently you can get a new one. But voting closes kind of five minutes after the end of this talk. So before you go grab your lunch, if you just want to do that voting there, that would be sweet. And uh, yeah, I think just put your hands together for Wolf Stuller. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. Hi. Um, so I was going to do a talk on when I submitted the paper. It was called Angular 2, Early Adoption. Um, Angular is now called Angular. This is how quickly it's changing, that even in the time between paper submission and being here now, they've decided to rename it. And it's been um, interesting, because every time we think we've got it covered, it uh, turns a little bit pear-shaped, and we get smacked from the side again. Um, so roughly me, I'm a CTO, founder, whatnot, of a tech company in Queenstown that does indemnity forms and liability waivers, which is really boring pieces of paper. We have a pretty cool tech stack, but basically we'd be that guy. And instead of the clipboard and piece of paper, we have like iPads. And it's like, woo, fun. Um, and what makes us different from a survey monkey Google form sort of thing is this bit at the bottom that the office use only where we generate uh, trip manifests and the, the operational side of guest data. Um, so we have a pretty regular um, infrastructure, I guess with the back end and restful JSON-y calls between stuff, which means it's relatively easy for us to swap out uh, clients that we use. And um, our uh, old legacy still in production in some places, clients involve uh, jQuery UI and jQuery mobile, which uh, I thought, yeah, since we're restful and doing all the right things properly. Shouldn't be no worries to plug in some Angular. And uh, yeah, so we started with Angular 1.x. And we got a few months into that. And then Google announced that there's a 2 coming. So we scrapped the Angular 1.x project, jumped on the 2 bandwagon, and from jumping on the two bandwagon until the point where they renamed it just Angular was interesting. So the red line or the pink line there is about where we started working on our uh, Angular 2 client. This graph is, we've all got GitHub profiles, we all know what a git commit log looks like, yeah. Um, that's the commits per day with the uh, upper bound being about 110 or so on the framework itself. When we jumped in, it looked like it was nice and calm. The first few weeks, months after we jumped on board, it was like, oh, sweet, this is easy. It's nice and stable now. Um, we jumped on when Google gave it a beta zero tag. Yeah. Um, and then three months into it, the, the graph started going spiky up and down as actual other people started using it, and lots of stuff broke. So as a little diversion, I want to bring up the subject of software out of date versus up to date. Now, I think there in our modern connected world, we kind of have two versions of software. Either you're up to date or you're not. Now, it makes it a lot easier that we are permanently online and we have uh, good data connections that are relatively cheap, which leads us to these evergreen software. Everyone, anyone know something? No? Okay. 
Um, the common examples, of course, are your browsers. Um, Adobe is to the point where I get updates every day and it installs something new, and I don't even know the names of the stuff anymore. It's just Photoshop CC 10 turn into 11, installed this thing and then the other thing. And uh, if anyone's used Linux, well, there's beautiful secure sign packages that keep everything rolling. Um, my last laptop used to run Arch Linux, which uh, operates on like a rolling release cycle that rather than going for a Windows 10, Windows 11 or whatever, um, rather than monthly, it's just continuously as new packages come out. And I'm quite happy of the rolling release, evergreen sort of cycle, but there have been problems in the past. Yeah? And the big one of why people are reluctant to upgrade comes because stuff breaks. And we've all been through this of upgrading Windows 95 to Windows XP and everything was hosed or iTunes had a new update and now suddenly my phone doesn't work. And uh, the Node, Node kids have been pretty good, or the NPM kids, and we've got this semantic versioning these days, supposed to, with the major version number. If that changes, expect something to break. If the middle one is of minor, version number is new features. But the API, the how you interact with packages, shouldn't change. And the last one, the patch, is bug fixes that don't break anything. So unless you're an alpha, or in this case, Google and beta. <laughs> mm -hmm. And stuff broke in absolutely terrifying ways, in ways that sometimes pretty obvious what's going on. But most of the time, we had these sort of scenarios. And you guys know what a black screen of death is? White screen of death? It's the most terrifying thing. You refresh your browser, you're working on your project, and it's blank. There's no error. It just doesn't work anymore. Like, nothing is shown in the browser window, nothing is shown on the console in the, in the browser, nothing is shown in your app server console. You're just standing there going, right, I've got 15,000 lines of code, I've updated 20 packages, and thank God for version control. <laughs> um, there were far, far too many times where we would get checkout back to where we were and started learning a trick that if in the NPM install, if you pass a command line flag to disable uh, displaying the progress of the install, it actually makes it quicker, because nobody wants to sit there and watch installs. Some of the breakages were pretty easily fixed with a bit of uh, regular expression, find, replace sort of stuff. That wasn't too bad. And sometimes the methods, you know, they, they, these sort of things are expected, deprecation. Uh, it is progress, yeah? But some of us weren't too happy, and uh, my, my right-hand man, Steve-O, was screaming and cursing my name for a very long time, going, why did, why? Like, can we not just wait six more months? Can we not use the legacy thing? The legacy thing works fine. But we got there, or we're working there, and we definitely learned some things. Um, turn errors on as loud as you can is the absolute biggest one. Um, we started paying for third-party services. I mean, there's a whole variety. Uh, we end up going with New Relic. Um, they, they have great monitoring of, dual monitoring of the back end and the front end and with all sorts of alerts that even on my phone and there's sane error settings and then there's uh, nice stack traces and you can set timers on things, it's, it's really good. I once upon a time worked in a web shop where I took over 
a few hundred old clients, you know, somebody got aqua hired by a, a YouTube sort of player and they abandoned their old local clients as they flew over to the States. And this PHP server had errors set to off. It was terrifying. Um, underneath the error set to off, there was credit cards getting stored and all of that. So these days, I'm sort of seeing error verbosity is almost a code smell that you have no reason to turn warnings off. In fact, the warnings are the greatest thing, saying that deprecation, that's cool. Next time you come across that piece of code, stop using the deprecation warning function. You know, just make the upgrade now rather than tomorrow, and then that way you can easily install the da-da-da. Yeah, we've all seen the always be closing. Well, always be testing. And uh, responsibly. Now, there's a uh, young chap in the audience here who, with whom I was talking yesterday of testing can be overdone. For example, we're working with alpha software or beta software at this point. Stuff changes, models change. You waste a lot of time to write tests for a model that's going to change tomorrow. But I recognize in myself, I don't write enough tests. I need to write more. I should always write more. So there's, there's a fine line, and I mean, it's up to ask yourself of where you should be, whether you should be probably writing more tests. We've all known this one. We've all sent this to a coworker. Mm -hmm. um, we are... Uh, um, a PG audience here, so we can skip out one of those letters. But I am a big, 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 big fan of actually opening the technical documentation. And in the case when we were playing with Angular in its early days, there were no blog posts. There were no YouTube podcasts or um, people standing up at the stage doing presentations. The best way to get this information was to actually read the manual. And sometimes that didn't even work. Now, source code is even better than the manual because these people, let's say the Google team who are working on Angular, are really smart coders. They write the best code. They write the code that you should be writing. They write beautiful self-documenting code and all those beautiful design patterns that we should be using more. And um, By reading the code, we started writing better ourselves. It's ready for launch. It just accelerated us very quickly. From we thought we were, oh yeah, this is easy, Angular 2, it's like Angular 1, whatever, but uh, a little bit faster, boom, whew, we're off. So to summarize, in the reading smart things, I also want to extend onto blogs. I have a blog. I assume many of you have blogs and have written blog posts. I know that when I write a blog post, it's generally because I've just learned something. It's not because I'm good at it, not because I know the whole field. I've just learned this one little thing, and I'm going to write about it. By definition, when I write a blog post, I know just enough to get myself into trouble. Blog posts on security, I mean, unless you're Brian Krebs or, you know, whatever, um, are generally pretty dangerous. I know as a developer, I often want the quickest answer to allow me to solve the problem and move on, which is a stack overflow answer or a blog answer. What I'm learning as I grow older is that the more time I spend reading manual sources and change logs, that's where I find the definitive truth without as much noise. So, making us better than before. Um, I have absolutely moted through these slides a lot quicker than I would have anticipated. 
Can anybody ask me some questions? Are we all desperately hungry for lunch? Because um, my wrapping up skills aren't the greatest. Um, Great. Yeah, so we... <laughs> awesome. We awesome. Already. Yes. Apologies that I've not put enough code examples, but hey, if you want code examples, you can read the manual. <laughs> Um, we've been there, or I've been there several times, right? The decision to go Angular 1 or 2 or whatever, and the upgrade path is always horrible, right? Yep. And I've never made it to version 2 or Angular itself now. Do you think now that it was worth it? I mean, because it's really painful. Yes, it, it is massively. It's, it, there, there is no upgrade path between Angular 1 and 2. That, that is the honest answer. Google would like to tell you but the reality is you're quicker writing from scratch and taking this opportunity writing from scratch to, well, write your code cleanly and properly. Um, I do think right now Angular 2 is production ready. Um, it is really nice. It is beautiful. It is smartly designed. There are still a lot of uh, third-party plugins that are plugins that are just a little bit less mature than the ones in Angular 1. Um, the internationalization sort of stuff could use another three, four months. Um, we are looking at, um, I guess, four-way data binding using something like CouchDB that uh, our client app stores data to WebSQL when it's offline and then when it connects, synchronizes and all that sort of stuff. We're doing a lot of that ourselves, which we expect in the next few months somebody's going to write a really nice, beautiful plugin for. Um, that said, I'm pretty confident of we're now at a happy state. Uh, we've noticed in the last few months that the breaking changes have really trailed off. We've been a lot more productive, wasting less time uh, staying up to date. Um, no, it's been good. And it's taught us to be better programmers. <laughs> Hadi, um, how have you guys been, um, I guess, going through something that's changing so fast? Do you just install, like, at latest, and just any time anyone installs, it just gets a different version? Or you just, um, like, every week review it or something? Like yeah, so b big fan of NPM shrink wrap which locks in the exact version numbers. And then most mornings, between uh, morning coming into the office, coffee chat, uh, we'll run a NPM uh, outdated, which shows us inside the package, uh, in inside the project, which packages can be updated. Um, and then we start by updating one or two of them. Um, often it would be a minor or patch uh, version for Angular. And then with the Angular meta package as such then includes its own dependencies and all that. Um, yeah, NPM shrink wrap is really useful. Um, and it's absolutely saved our bacon a lot of times, especially on the back end and the server where we've um, mangled some of our dependencies into uh, branching off. And then we're taking this particular uh, NPM shrink wrap lets you pull individual uh, commits from a Git repo, which is like not not just that release and not just that release, but that commit in between. Yeah. I'm just wondering, on average, uh, how much of your time was spent uh, taking care of sort of may, uh, sorry um, doing those upgrade paths versus your yep <laughs> um, you know rolling out features? And, and second part was, what was the longest time you were just out um, just just doing the output, like blocked upgrading it? Um, normally, some of our, and this, hence this slide, some of our breakages, oh geez, I do recall at one point um, we broke, oh, no, we, Steve, I think, spent four and a half days on one fix, and he was not happy about that. I mean, that's four and a half days of productivity gone, his life gone, you know, all he wanted to do was build cool things, and instead he's going through line by line replacing this crap that, why? Um, it, it lost a lot. Yeah, it was 
not the happiest. Your second question, <laughs> no. I mean, and, and I'm sort of standing there as the boss guy going, hey man, it's all right, you know, you're getting paid. And he's like, no, nah, it's not all right. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting, why, why can't we build something cooler? And he's sort of getting close to throwing his toys and saying, you know, he's contemplated um, hiding the next time an update comes out so that we wouldn't have to do it until the next time after that or something. Um, but it did teach us also to use our IDEs a little bit better. Um, we at the started off, I, I guess I, I'm a Vim user, and I use Sublime Text in Vim mode, and it has a few little sort of jumpy around things that uh, legacy vintage mode or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we, uh, we started exploring these modern IDEs like WebStorm because you can jump from here to there to there easily in your code. And it doesn't, like, modern IDEs that don't care how many files and how many directories you've got um, and do decent project-wide uh, intelligent search and replaces. Um, because your, your, your classic search and replace matches the string, but if there's anything prefix or suffix, it will change that too. Whereas some of these, like uh, WebStorm has a search and replace on it that only if it's the un uh, individually freestanding variable name will it search and replace it, which uh, that saved our bacon. Um, part two of your question was? You answered part two. Ah, OK. You answer part two, but part one, like, are you talking like it was like 10, 20 percent of the time overall? Uh, overall time was probably into the three, four percent, like sub 10 percent, definitely. Um, but when you are wanting to build a product and you have in your head what you want, so creating a version two as such of uh, we have an existing clients client apps that do this thing, um, so we know what we wanted. Anything distracting us from the ability to get there is annoying and frustrating. Um, yeah, I, in a heartbeat, we'd do it again. Um, I think we're, it, it was a good learning curve. It's probably, it is, um, I guess I'm a sufferer for type two fun, the, uh, the bike ride home in the rain. You're absolutely miserable on the way home, but you get there and you're like, hey, that was actually pretty cool, you know? I enjoy that, and I think Steve-O does too. So, <laughs> well, or he has no option, but he got home in the end, and, and he can now sort of look back on and go, wow, that was, uh, that was an adventure. Hi. Do you use um, tree shaking or um, lazy loading of routes to deal with the massive bundle issue? Um, we do use lazy loading. Um, I forget the exact name. Of the, it's the standard plugin that we have. Um, and yes, tree shaking. So tree shaking, if you guys don't know what it is, is uh, the greatest thing of Angular 2. So Angular 2 has um, really nicely, they've retooled the build chain. And tree shaking is um, a lot more intelligent than, let's say, the Google Clojure compiler of days gone by, where we'll take all of our uh, templates, all of our services, all of our methods, all of everything, and the Angular libraries themselves, and all the helper libraries and all that, and get rid of what's not needed. Um, meaning that it becomes really lazy, I become lazy, that I can use, for example, Lodash, and I install the full-blown Lodash, and I trust my build process to get rid of Lodash underscore, you guys know, yeah? Um, to get rid of all of the functions that we don't need, and thus reduce the, uh, the download size. Um, really good. I, I really like it. It's... Um, it's scary now to look at other projects that don't involve tree shaking and lazy loading and go, wow, come on, you know? I mean, from there was a talk yesterday about the isomorphic web apps. We'd like to go a bit further into that domain, which is not really Angular 2's strength or Angular's strength at the moment. Um, I'm sure that's coming. Cool. It's nice having a long question period. I saw one here. Can I just see, are there other questions in the room as well? 
Got one there. I thought I saw something over here. Maybe not. Maybe it got answered. We'll go over there, and then maybe one more after that. Hello. Thanks. Hi. Um, could you expand on the testing story? Were you writing a lot more unit tests? Um, the second question, how's the end-to-end uh, -end testing been working out for you with Protractor? End-to-end um, -end testing and unit testing has, um, I don't write enough tests. I hate tests. I'm really lazy. I'm a I'm cowboy. I like to think I have a very good uh, seeing the forest for the trees approach. And generally, I don't let too many errors slip through me. Um, I probably don't communicate my uh, visions and where I want code to go enough to my rest of the crew, and that's generally where my faults lie. Um, but the testing of Angular 2 is, has been really scary in the sense that Steve-O, my right-hand man, um, he created an Angular 2 uh, testing boilerplate repo or whatever, that has become the definitive Angular 2 testing boilerplate starting point. Um, and we're sort of looking and going, why is no one else doing this? It's really scary. Um, the tests run. They do their thing. It generates the code. It expects, um, I would probably refer to Steve-O for more the de detailed technical ones. Um, I have right at the first slide of my GitHub profile and Steve-O's GitHub profile is linked on these slides at the end somewhere. Where are we? All the way to the start. That one. Yeah? Um, <laughs> Wait. No, maybe not. <laughs> um, but my, my GitHub is first name, so, is surname, and uh, hey, blame it on Windows. Um, <laughs> Awesome. Um, yeah, so the testing has left a lot to be desired. It's been a particularly sore point where the Google team has gotten a lot of flack that how are you releasing something without tests uh, in 2007 and how are you expecting, like, how are you expecting serious professional developers to jump on a project if testing isn't built into it out of the box? Um, and yeah, it's... That's kind of crap. Cool. So uh, the nice thing is it is being videoed. So I think you said it's on the first slide. So if somebody is looking for it, they can also find it there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we do have one last question up for grabs if somebody wants it. Otherwise, there have been a bunch of questions. So I think that managed to fill the time pretty well. Lots of interesting answers. Uh, yeah. So let's leave it there. Uh, we're going to go, everybody's going to go off and have lunch. And I think we're back at approximately 1.45. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. So, oh, one thirty. One thirty. That's uh, yes. Pardon me. Um, yeah. So we're going to continue at one thirty. Enjoy your lunch. Enjoy the fresh air. See you in an hour and a half.